I wanted people to dig and look deeper, even though I was writing in very simple prose. Mm -hmm. And I do want to talk about the prose real quick, because when I first started writing the book, I started kind of writing literary fiction. That was what I wanted to start. And then I stopped. I said, why? Why do I need to hide all what I'm trying to say behind super flowery prose to make it land easier? Welcome to our latest book reporter talks to interview where our guest today is Lola Akmade Akerstrom, whose book in every mirror she's black is just one of my favorites. It's just been such a yeah. pleasure to be reading it and I'm so looking forward to this conversation. Let's go to somebody that we talked to a couple of weeks ago, Taylor Jenkins Reed, who you all remember, the author of Balboa Rising, Daisy Jones and the Six. Well, let's see how she describes the book. It's a wise and complicated exploration of the lives of three black women in America and Sweden, a sharply written story with messy, deeply moving characters, raising brutal questions and steering clear of easy answers. It's a book that will stick with you long after you've turned the last page. Oh I would agree with Taylor. <laughs> and for that reason and many more, it's a book reporter bets on selection. Yeah, so, thank you so much. Welcome, Lola, <laughs> well, so nice to have you here. I'm excited to be here and that wonderful blurb from Taylor. Each time I hear it, it's just so heartwarming. So, and thank you so much for having me. I know, and you're joining us today from Stockholm, Sweden. And this is the thing we love about Zoom, everybody. We can find, we can Zoom all over. So yes. we're pretending we're in Sweden today. <laughs> we wish we were. <laughs> yes, it's a beautiful place, beautiful place. So let's start with your telling us about In Every Mirror's Black. Just give us like the Give us the whole, like, an estimate, the uh, background absolutely, on it. Absolutely. So in Every Mirror, She's Black follows the lives of three very different Black women who end up in Sweden for very different reasons. Mm -hmm. And one is Kemi. She's a marketing executive who is just fantastic at her job, it's very successful, but struggling in her personal life. Mm -hmm. And so she gets this opportunity to move to Sweden. And then Brittany is a former flight attendant. Well, actually, she is a former model working as a flight attendant who meets uh, Yoni, Johan, on the flight to Sweden and starts something that, that way. And then Muna is a refugee from Somalia who lost her family and is trying to start a new life in this new place to find a footing, to find belonging. And so the book kind of chronicles their stories and how they kind of intersect or don't intersect and what it means to be a Black woman navigating this space. Mm. It's just so well done. What inspired you to write this? Where was the kernel of the idea? Because I know you've been working on it for a while. Yes. So it's the, the idea actually came because just to back up a bit, I used to write fiction when I was younger. So in my preteens and my teens, I used to write a lot of fiction uh, back home in Nigeria, which is where I grew up. And then fast forward many years later, I was trying to rewrite some of those fiction stories, but I was struggling, right? Why am I not reconnecting with those characters? And it wasn't until I was on vacation in Portugal, I just finished reading Americana. Mm -hmm. And I, when I closed it, I was like, that's it. I mean, I have so many experiences. I work as a travel writer. I've, I, I look for the nuances in culture. I've written an old book about Swedish culture. Um, why don't you start closer to you, you know? Mm -hmm. And so even though these women are not me, they're also me in many, sense, in many ways. And so that's kind of where the kernel of the idea came. And then I started crafting out the characters and then writing the story. Were there always three characters from the start or was it two or one, or was it always three that you were telling the story of? So it was always gonna be at least three. And I kept it at three because adding a fourth <laughs> voice would have just made it a lot messier. Yeah, yeah. But but I wanted to, because I wanted it to be three to tackle career, class, and culture. Mm -hmm. So I wanted three very different women. And then the reason I had it, Yoni is because, um, just speaking in general, Black women don't move to Sweden without a valid reason. Mm -hmm. It's not like I wake up one day and say, I want to move to Spain or Italy or Portugal. That makes more sense to me as a Black woman. But for me to move to Sweden, it's something that has to bring me. And most of the time it's usually love. Maybe you meet a Swede or you meet somebody, you move to Sweden. 
maybe you get transferred from your company or you find a job there or you come in as a refugee or maybe college but it's not a you know place you kind of move on the whim mm-hmm. especially as a black woman and so that's why Yoni's character was important in the story as well mm-hmm. so there's let's balance of all of them so did you develop one in, in full first like did you start with Kemi like which one did you start with writing or was it a little bit of each along the way so I started a little bit of each along the way, but I actually spent about four to five months working on the characters, meaning just outlining just little bullet points. Oh, this is a this is Kemi, this is a quirks, this is what she likes, she doesn't like, Johnny, okay, maybe this person, that person. So that when it was actually time to write, I already had a good idea of what the characters were as people, what they will do, what they won't do, what they'll say, what they won't say. And so the writing itself actually took like what they call the dirty draft took four months to write Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that dirty draft the the thing at the very beginning where it's the messy draft (laughs) exactly through there and it was like this you know each of these women are running into the same issue of being seen for their race but for different reasons and did you know each of their challenges in advance did you know like this is exactly what she's going to be walking into and because of the messy outline yes because I have so many experiences. I mean, I've lived in Sweden for 11 years. I have a large network here. I know a lot of Black women here in Korea, different classes, also refugees. So I had a good sense of some of the things they were going to meet along the way. Mm -hmm. Una, I actually spent about two, three years as a photographer at an asylum center in Sweden. Mm -hmm. So I knew and met people like Mona, you know, people like Ahmed, you know, and spending time just taking, working on a photography project with them just to, just so that they are seen as them first instead of the label refugee, you know? Mm-hmm. And then with, you know, Brittany, I know many people like Brittany as well, you know, where maybe you marry into um, a different class, but also holding onto your American badge, you mm-hmm. know, because yeah. if you drop it, then you're going to be treated differently. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, there are many career women like Kenya as well. And I am also a career woman as well. And so there were so many places and spaces I could pull from based mm-hmm. on my own experiences, based on my network, based on people I know to cre- create and craft the characters. Mm. You know, and Kemi's hired. I love this, right? Because a company needs to get its diversity image right. Like they've yes. made this big faux pas. And it was really, I'm not going to spoil what the faux pas is, but it's pretty funny what they do. I mean, it really yes. is. And it's a really huge faux pas. Yes. And it's really funny. It's almost sad that no one caught what they did. Like they were yes. so in, in their own heads, they didn't even figure out what's going on. And I feel like there are a lot of people right now, a lot of companies, a lot of publishers, whatever, that are trying to get it right. It's been going on a lot this past year. But your book was turned in by then. So was this something you'd always been seeing for a while? Because it's, let's bring in somebody. And I was like, we're going to hire so-and-so. And everybody has a diversity person now. They have this yes. person now. that we're like, And they're going to fix what we've been doing wrong institutionally. All these years that we've had this company, this person is going to come in and save us from ourselves. Exactly. <laughs> and I just saw that. And I was like, wait a second. She already knew about this person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And this is the thing. It's, there's so many of this kind of faux pas happening in Europe as well, you know, and it's been for many years, you know, for very large brands, I'm not going to name names, but there are many that oh, just over the last few years have been making some crazy mistakes. And it points to just how not diverse the decision makers are. Because there's all there's this quote, and I forget who said who, who the quote comes from, but it says, you know, diversity is who is in the room, and influence is who has, or inclusion is who has influence in the room, right? Mm-hmm. And so people get stuck on the diversity, or let's just show faces and we'll be fine, mm-hmm. you know, instead of actually including those voices at the decision making stage. Mm-hmm. And the thing with diversity is. It's not just the buzzword, it's actually helping you catch your blind spots, right? Mm -hmm. I was talking to a friend of mine, Matteo, recently, and he said that there was this perspective of the people in the middle of a circle, because they are not on the margins of the circle, they have a smaller perspective than those on the margins, because those on the margins can see (laughs) wider, right? It's true, you know, and, and look at it as that's 
just an advantage, you know, for you to bring those people with larger perspectives, mm -hmm. those that are marginalized outside that circle in to, you know, to create a better, a stronger company. So, yeah, I mean, I, this was something I had to tackle because it just kept happening and happening. And I'm like, okay, that's it. I have to <laughs> address it in this book. And the idea of the, the circle is exactly true because it can't also be just turned to the room and say, Kenny, what do you think? Kenny, yes. what's your thought about this? Yeah. And it's instead, she is the only person. She's the only person at the company then. And she also doesn't come in in the role she thought she was coming in. She's coming in under HR all of a sudden. Yes. And she's a marketer. And all of a sudden, they got her in the HR. And she's like, but she's there like, why am I in this like, you know, reporting structure? And it's yes. like, well, no, what we really need you to do is just make sure we don't make any mistakes so we can point to you to figure yes. out what to do. Exactly. Yeah. So that, so that, that's kind of part of Kemi's story in there as well. Yes. Yeah, that's great. She's also a ferocious dater. I'm going to call her ferocious dater. <laughs> she works the apps for dates and she's quite good at it. She can swipe yeah. right. She can swipe right. She can swipe left. She's there. And early in the book, it's noted that according to every dating survey that she read, a black African woman was the least uh, desirable prospect among um, along with Asian men. I like love this way. This was, and I was humored by this because I listened to an interview where I learned that you and your husband met on a dating site. So tell us about this more about this little factoid because exactly he's dropping this, but I'm like, no, 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 folks. I've researched yeah. You've got some story on I it. I know, I know, absolutely. And and I do want to say that, you know, Kemi is not me. The no. character is actually not me. But uh I did kind of add that online dating element to it as well. Those statistics are true. You know, I mean, there have been lots of different uh reports that have come out, you know, especially with all these different dating apps and trying to tackle prejudice and things like that in the apps. So those statistics are true. I met my husband in 2006 mm -hmm. at the very kind of beginning of this mm -hmm. whole thing where people were still serious, <laughs> you know, like yes, you know, back yes. then. <laughs> and when there was still a lot of stigma as well associated with saying, oh, you know, this is new. How can, you know, how can I meet somebody this way? So, but I mean, the rest is history. You know, we, I spent a lot of time in Stockholm. We're traveling back and forth. And um, at the time I used to work as a programmer. So mm -hmm. my company allowed me to work remotely. So, so it, it wasn't like a, we were dating online. It was actually, a, that's how we met. But the relationship was obviously a, <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> offline. Yes. Yeah, but it was, it was so interesting too that you were able to travel and work from away so long yes. ago in 2006. Yes. And it's yes. funny because companies are now, oh, let's let everyone go do this. And I'm like, correct. And, and, and I will mention the company I worked for because they were instrumental. It's the name of the company is called Woolpert, Midwestern Company. Mm -hmm. And for them to be that open at that time, I mean, I'd worked for them up to 12 years at that time. So, I, you know, they really knew me. They they wanted me to be happy as well, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm giving them that shelter to be able to do that way back then and be open-minded, especially for a Midwestern company at that time. So I, I think uh, they were one of the few, you know, being open to that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like really, really terrific. I love the backstory. I mean, like, hey, I really love this. It's great. She got married, moved to Stockholm. <laughs> now we've got Brittany. She's a flight ascendant and Yanni sees her and wants her in his life. Like he just hones in on her on the airplane and that's it. And she and the readers don't learn why until later in the book. And it's not something we're not going to spoil, but without giving anything more away, tell us a little bit more about Brittany. Let's bring her to life right. a little bit for people. Yeah. So Brittany, I wanted to create a character in, in Brittany that you also find in Europe a lot, right? Because that's why I wanted to bring that fetish in. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a stunning, beautiful, statuesque woman. And I wanted to show a different kind of black woman as well that, you know what, maybe she wants to find out things in life. She's tired of struggling. Her family struggled mm -hmm. and she wants to maybe also use her beauty as, you know, an advantage if it will make life a lot easier. And so I had to create, you know, Brittany as a character because her story is valid. You know, mm -hmm. she's a very valid, very, she's very smart mm -hmm. and she doesn't have to be strong or independent all the time you know that's the story that society says black women we were born to struggle that is our narrative no we we want to thrive as well right mm -hmm. and so i think i wanted to create 
that's in Britney that you know what she doesn't you don't have to like her but she's valid mm -hmm. and her story matters and it's worthy and and so I wanted to create that character as well where one day you like her one day you don't so and that scene with her with her boyfriend before she goes you learn a lot about her very quickly and you also learn you know, why is she going is she going to validate herself or is she going the relationship's not working there's a lot for the reader to sit and play with there Yes, yes. So, but a lot of it has to also do with privilege. Mm -hmm. She wants to test, test what the ultimate privilege mm -hmm. feels like. Yeah. And wealth, power, and privilege are something Yanni can bring, Brittany. Yes. And her boyfriend asks her, actually, is this why you're attracted to him? He's showing up with privilege that would need to be earned by another man. Mm. And I love that line because it's somebody else is just going to be able to walk in and do this. But instead, he, he doesn't have to work at it. He's got yeah. the name. He's got the title. He comes from the family, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, yeah. And I think that there's a scene in the book. It, it's not really going to spoil anything, but there's a scene with Britney's father where she's telling, uh, he's telling Britney, like, don't forget who you are, that you're never going to have the privilege he has just because he breathes, you know, mm -hmm. you only have the privilege that he's giving you, you know, and, and just to add that perspective as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. And she once she says at one point at the end of part one, that Yanni is a man who couldn't lie to her face. And it's this line that's going to come to haunt readers later. And yes. was the placement of that line really deliberate up front? Because I went back, I, I folded down a bunch of pages when I was reading and I went back and I go, there's something there. Very yes. good. <laughs> yes, it, it was definitely just kind of leaving breadcrumbs along the way, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, it worked. It worked. Um, I love when she meets his parents and they speak Swedish yes. and it is not interpreted for us on the page. Like yes. we don't know what they said. And yes. usually, you know, it's a line and then it's this they said and doesn't. And we're not getting that at all. I'm trying to figure out if I was reading the ebook, if I would click and all the words would come up. Yes. Well, it, so so in the original manuscript, we I, I actually had the, uh, you know, the translation. But then during the edits, working with the amazing Krista and Erin from uh, Source Books, my amazing editors, we're like, but we're in Britney's point of view. She's not mm -hmm. going to understand what they're saying, you know. Because as authors, we want to kind of take the easy way out and just like trans translate everything. But it is a very charged converse, uh, conversation. And if you add the ebook version, I, you know, implore everyone to just take it and translate it because mm -hmm. then you're going to like, oh my God, is that what they are talking about in front of Britney? Right. You know, but it's, you know, it's essentially, you know, the mom kind of saying, you know, is this your toy of the week? Mm -hmm. Um is it only like, what are you doing? What's this, you know, stuff like that. So. Right. right. And I love it. It's not interpreted. And I keep saying, wait, am I missing something? Am I missing something? But mm -hmm. I think the fact that we don't know, but we're judging the expression on their faces, the expression on his face and her being, you know, oh, she didn't pick up the Swedish so quickly that yeah. she even knows what they're saying to her. Yeah. And they're very clear on that. I mean, I think it would have been very funny if she just came back and started answering them, but Correct. I know it's a really tough language. So yes. you know, that yes. wasn't happening. <laughs> So, yeah, but, but I think I think readers, you know, if they are really patient, just take those lines and translate them. I think they will really enjoy that scene oh. because those lines are very powerful, like how, what they're saying in Swedish to each other. Ah, oh, there's my assignment yeah. for tonight. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> yes. Cut and paste. Let's Cut go. Cut and paste. You know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so then we've got Moon, the third character. She's a refugee. Mm. She's trying to pull herself to a better station in life. And there's so many odds that are wrapped around her and against her, like just completely. Yes. She she's trying so hard and she's really alone. I mean, the, yes. the whole thing is everybody else has got a fallback position. They've got family they can fall back to. She doesn't. And so she's working as a cleaner in Yanni's uh, the company where Yanni is. And it's the kind of person where she would be invisible to him. He would yes. not see her while he would see the other two women, even if he ignore, half ignored them. Yes. She's completely invisible. So tell us more about her, because yes. I think that she's the one that um, we we don't know as well. Like we yes. haven't seen her in our lives quite the same way. Yes. And that's why I wanted to write a story, because mm -hmm. I see her a lot here in Sweden. Mm -hmm. You know, we see a lot of Munas in Europe as well, where especially when I spent a lot of time at the asylum center, meeting people I, I knew when I met them that I have to write and get some of these voices out. You know, mm -hmm. there's even a line which Ahmed said in the book that's inspired by somebody I met. He said something similar. Mm -hmm. And with Muna, Muna 
even though she's just been through some horrendous things, you know, in her life, she's trying to do everything right, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm, she's learning the language, she's working at, she has the strongest work ethic, she, mm-hmm. she's doing everything right, but in a society that really doesn't see her, you know, or keeps moving, mm-hmm. you know, the bars, and I always say, like, Muna, a part of my teenage self is in Muna as well, because when I moved from Nigeria to the U.S., even though I wasn't a refugee, I was isolated a lot. I was just trying to figure my way there. So I, I could connect with our loneliness a lot or a kind of lack of belonging in that sense. But I thought it was really important to include Muna as well for perspective, because there's also privilege within different Black women. Mm-hmm. You know, so I wanted to show that if I'd just written a story about Brittany and Kemi, then I'm missing a crucial voice mm-hmm. because there's always perspective, you know. It doesn't mean that it's not a suffering Olympics where just because Muna suffers more than Britney, then Britney's uh, situation is invalid. It's just showing that there's so many different nuances and stations in life. Mm-hmm. You know, I was thinking of, and I can't remember the name of the book. Christy Alftieri uh, wrote a book a couple of years ago about working, in, she was working in a refugee camp and she mm. worked right about some people that were there might have been songbird i'm very bad on remembering titles so don't quote me but it was like you were in the camp with the people and you were seeing this desperation and they wanted to get to london that was the big ticket sweden was like a close second of where people wanted to go and i was thinking a lot about that book because people are like the next station in life you've got to get a ticket to and where's your ticket going to be and when you get that ticket where are you going to be in the rung on the ladder when you get there and that's what i was thinking of when i saw muna Yes. No, absolutely. And and it's very, it's challenging for refugees. And yes, you know, Sweden does a great job of bringing people in, but it's the follow through, right? You know, Mm -hmm. and I call Sweden home. I love the country. I'm a travel writer. I write about the best parts of Sweden to visit. It's a Mm -hmm. beautiful country, but I'm also a black woman in Sweden and it's a multidimensional country Mm -hmm. than we see from the outside in, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm trying to show more of that aspect of it and saying that it's okay to show that we are actually multidimensional, we are vulnerable in certain you know, aspects and we're not always perfect. You know? And so it was important to tell Mona's story because it's a very valid, very real uh, story. Yeah, and you kind of think if you saw each other on the subway, you'd nod because yes. you are a lot alike. But yes. by the same token, you know you're not alike. You know yeah. you're not alike at the same thing. Yeah, and, and sometimes uh, you don't even nod sometimes because I was also trying to show that women are so different just because we are black doesn't mean we have anything in common Mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, or may not relate to each other. So even though I am another and I nod at everybody, I also don't get offended if I don't get a nod back. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm trying to show the individuality within Mm -hmm. being a black, you know, black uh, women as well. So. Yeah, it's not like one swath. Let's not just no. paint the thing one way. No. Exactly. Yeah. No. And she's made us be vulnerable so many times. I found myself stealing myself to read her pages. Mm. And I felt like that was intentional on your part. I mean, we, she'd have something great coming along and then it'd be whisked away from her. Yes. She'd get an apartment, things would be going well. And then things that she had no control over would be ripping that situation out from under her. And also there was the control that others had on her. Yeah. And it was you will work here, but really, maybe you won't. Maybe you'll just be let go. We'll go someplace else. And there's no safety net. And I found myself really looking at somebody that there is no safety net. Yes. And and Muna is, to me, the strongest Mm -hmm. character in terms of just spirit and grit. Mm -hmm. You know, she's the strongest. She's had to go through a lot. She's very smart. And I'm also showing that, imagine... Um, if just some of the smartest people we've lost or we may not be able to, you know, uh, meet or may not be able to interact with because life always deals just very difficult, you know, difficult things beyond your control. Mm -hmm. You know, so those are kind of stories and themes and subject matters I wanted to explore in the Mm -hmm. book as well. I feel like the Kemi and Brittany would be able to rebuild their lives more easily than Muna. Like they'll be able to do that when things are shattered and they're all on the same playing field, but she is on a different step. And for yes. her to rebuild it's, there's not the financial security, the family security, all those other things. So we're alike, but different. 
Yeah. And, and that's why I put as a, a voice in the book as well. It was important to show mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. kind of the, the range of what it is to be a black woman in the world. So, yeah, exactly. At what point Brittany is quite told quite bluntly about privilege. She gets her privilege from Yanni, but she will never have the privileges he has just because he breathes. Yes. And there's a really powerful set of lines there. They're, for readers, they're going to read this book. There's a lot you could underline and go back and really look at because from your writing, writing from experience, but also trying to not teach, but show different yes. people's lives. I think it becomes really important. Uh, was that line one that you like always knew was there? Like, are there some lines you wrote around or they just came in? No, they just kind of came in, you know? And, and I think it's once you um, know the characters well, and you know kind of their thought processes and what they're looking for. I, I, I knew what Brittany was looking for, you know, mm-hmm. from the very start, you know, and I knew I needed to create, I mean, the book is very nuanced. I keep saying that because there's so many different lines that you go back and read again. Uh, for example, there's Johnny says, I want to fly your parents over and the parents are no, thank you. Well, it's okay. And then they dig into their savings to buy economy tickets Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know little little kind of things like that they're just all over the book and so I wanted to show I wanted people to dig and look deeper even though I was writing in very simple prose Mm -hmm. and I do want to talk about the prose real quick because when I first started writing the book I started kind of writing literary fiction that was what I wanted to start and then I stopped I said why why do I need to hide or what I'm trying to say behind super flowery prose to make it land easier, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? And I said, you know what? I'm just going to write it in just really good prose, but just simple, clear, sharp, you know, precise and and let people connect with it. So it feels Mm -hmm. easy to read. So it doesn't feel like, oh crap, I need to go crack a dictionary now. And what's she trying Mm -hmm. to say, you know? So that for Mm -hmm. me was actually very intentional because you know, in my other work as a travel writer, I go a little bit more li- literary in the way I write my um, uh, creative nonfiction. So, so yeah, so it's a very uh, interesting book, you know, and there's so many, many things that you can go back and. Yeah, you go back and talk about. Yeah. Yes. I mean, another point, number of points, someone says straight to Kemi, you shouldn't have come here, at least in America, you're fighting your enemy in broad daylight. Are really things that different in Sweden? Is everything really, that it is that different? So, so when I moved here um, a couple of years ago, many of my friends were asking, well, what's it like to be a black woman in Sweden? Because Sweden is beautiful. There are many things that, you know, I don't want to take for granted, you know, in terms of work like life balance, which my taxes also contribute to, you know, there's a lot of, you know, wonderful things. And I do write about it as a travel writer and I'll keep writing. But they, ask, they, they, they say, you know, what's the difference? And I say, in the US, racism is rife, but we talk about it, right? It's out in the front. front. We mm-hmm. discuss it. It's uncomfortable. We have to have the uncomfortable conversations. And even if there's a racist that doesn't like me, at least they believe I can be like Oprah Winfrey. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. In Europe, it's a bit more just stay in your corner, you're quiet nobody's going to bug you. You're going to have your happy, you know, quiet, balanced life in the corner. But the minute you try to thrive out of that corner, then it's like, aren't you grateful? What, what more do you want? You can't, why do you want to come be the CEO of Ericsson or Ikea or, you know, that is a different kind of, um, it's almost like stay in a corner, be quiet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what? Model this behavior and stay this behavior. And and good. Behavior. Yeah, and then you live a perfect life. And for me, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't allow people to live their best lives. And that is also why I created Yoni mm-hmm. as somebody that wasn't allowed to just be different mm-hmm. and, and own his quirks as well, you know? So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a deep, deep conversation for sure. It's, it's a deep conversation, a deep dive, but I, you've made it so approachable in the book that I find that you can have, I mean, a great book club discussion book, great book club discussion for just to sit there and see where people are going to you know, take the different angles of it. I remember reading somewhere that 25% of Sweden's population is made up of foreigners. And is it, do they have that same treatment of everybody or is it just people of color? It's people of color. Mm-hmm. It is people of color. So, you, so if you're not, if you're white 
or, or you know Nordic person, then oh yeah, you're just an expat, you know, yeah, not a problem immigrant. But the minute you're brown, then it's like oh, you're different. You're even and and for me, there's so many Swedes that are born in Sweden that are brown. Like it's you know so yeah. that so they consider themselves Swedes, but when society already starts saying you're because you're brown then you're from somewhere automatically from somewhere else that also makes it difficult for Swedes of color born in Sweden grown up with a culture that call it their own that don't know anywhere else you know so so it's a, it's super super complicated but it needs to be discussed right mm -hmm. and that's the I think the problem is uh, people don't like discussing uncomfortable things. No, they don't. They, they like don't, to sweep yeah. them under. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they like um, to pretend they don't exist or they want yeah. to pretend that they've got a better hand on them. Yes. Like we hired these people and now we feel better. We yeah. hired, the, we, we brought Kemi yes. in. So now we feel good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's like that kind of, uh, I feel good. So what you're saying doesn't make me feel good. And you're making me feel weird. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, but that's my lived experience, you know, so it's a very, you know, so, so that's the thing. It's, all, it's nuanced. We need to be able to have these discussions. It doesn't mean we do not love each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, uh, the thing I, I know kind of at the start of the pandemic, there, there was a big kind of rift between kind of native Swedes and a lot of foreigners because of the approach, you know, to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And people are like, just because we do not agree doesn't mean we do not love each other, you know, and, and that's the kind of consensus mindset. Like once you don't agree, then you are against and then you are sidelined immediately. Like, you know, so, yeah. Yes, that division that comes. Yes. So do you, can you speak, do you speak Swedish? And was it tough yes, to I learn? Yes, I speak Swedish, yes. Was I it as tough Swedish. to learn as it sounds like in the book? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, so it's a language without too many words, but the problem is the pronunciations, you know, mm -hmm. that's what's going to get you. Um, mm -hmm. So, but it can be tricky to learn, you know, and especially since many people, most Swedes speak very good English. Mm -hmm. When you start speaking, they switch to English so they can practice their own English. And then it's like five years later, your Swedish is still, you know, plateaued. Exactly. So, so that's the situation here. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, I, I do speak Swedish. Yeah, let's put this way. I have seven years of Spanish, like, you know, that my parents paid a lot of money for. I couldn't talk. I couldn't tell our cleaning lady who's from Guatemala. She was yes. perfect English. If I tell her something in Spanish, I'd be totally out of it. Yeah, she should I be am, like, she's like, don't waste my time. Saying, don't insult me, rug. just speak English. <laughs> so. exactly. Zero yes. words will come out of my mouth. Zero yes. words. You know, and if unless I'm mistaken, all three women do not come together until page 339 in the book. Like it's Correct. very late in the book. Unless, I, in fact, I was going back and going, did I miss something or whatever? And I like that because they were all standing on their own. Were they always all standing on their own or do you have them together um, earlier in drafts? No, no, no. In fact, in the drafts, I actually didn't have um, Brittany and Mona even meeting at all, like mm -hmm. in the beginning, because she's in a different class. Like there's no reason for them to really right. interact naturally because Muna works at his office and uh, Brittany is like a trophy wife at home, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and then in the original manuscript, Yoni and, and Muna never met at all. But then as we went through edits, I'm like, you know what? I need to, we need to create just a few more scenes just to, very light scenes where they just interact. And so I created some moments where Mona and Yoni kind of interacted, but not interacted. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Brittany, Mona had seen Brittany, mm -hmm. you know, waiting outside, but really didn't know her. So it was at the end where it felt organic to kind of make them meet. That was when yeah, I added it. something organic to make it happen. Correct, yeah. correct. And then of course, Mona and and Kemi meet at work once in a while because Kemi needs advice and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, it sort of goes back and forth like that. But I realized it was page 339 and I was like, wow, that was very, very far into the book yes. before I started to see these two getting together. Yes. So you also have this phrase, um, Loki racist. What's a Loki racist? So, <laughs> so Loki racist, and that's a conversation that uh, Brittany and Kemi were having because most people expect them to be friends, but they mm -hmm. are not friends, you know. But when you say low-key racist, it's somebody that doesn't think they are racist, but they're like prejudiced, you know? And so it's like they have biases and they're 
like, well, I'm not like people that feel like they're not racist, but at the end of the day, say things to things that show some kind of bias or mm-hmm. underlying prejudice without, you know, actually going out there and holding this, like, you know, a waving. So that was kind of the phrase. And when um, Brittany says it and Kemi was like, what does that even mean? Brittany say, says, you know what I mean? And she was irritated, mm-hmm. you know, that Kemi was saying, well, what does that even mean? Because of Usho's, you know, saying was, you know, there was something else going, you know, with exactly. the character there. So, so that was, so again, that's kind of like a little nuanced interaction where I didn't have to expand it, but Brittany was like, you know what I mean? Irritated because Kemi was like, what do you mean? That's stupid, you know? So you've got it right there. It's right yeah. there on the page. You know, it's yes. funny because when I went to high school, there was um, a, a few black girls in school and that was known as like Angie, the black girl, like, you know, mm. I mean? like that's the way that people were defined. Yeah. And my son was in high school and he was doing a project with um, a child and the kid was like really not pulling his weight. Yeah. And we went to the exhibit and we found out this child was black and my son mm. had never said this is a black child. But he never came home and said, so, so is Indian. He never right. came home and said any of these things that I'm, you know, that many years older. And that's how we were defining people. And that's how, and they probably would have gone home and they said, there's somebody white in my class that yeah. I'm going to bring over to yeah. my house. And it was these labels that didn't quite exist the same way. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's the shame because children, yeah. because children don't really do that it's it's learned from adults it's learned from parents it's learned from society or or the kind of one-dimensional narratives that are shared you know Mm -hmm. via media but that's the thing like even with my kids when they are describing a classmate or somebody they don't say oh she's black or oh she's brown or that that's not the first thing because Mm -hmm. they don't you know and they and even if they do it they say it in a way that doesn't add value or what to that definition Mm -hmm. so it's something that as they grow society teaches and and I don't know it's I think a couple of generations have to die out you know so that the newer generation you know can start purging all this you know yeah kind so of, what um, are we saying what are we doing yeah. and why are we doing it you exactly know, it's- because it's it's um hopefully the newer generation is kind of seeing each other in a different light you know mm-hmm. and not attaching kind of this old historical labels on us on who we are supposed to be as people so yeah, I remember you wrote a piece for the New York Times. I was looking this up last, I think it was July. It's a really terrific piece about something that happened with your daughter at school and trying to explain. And um, actually, we're going to link to that piece. I know there's a firewall on the Times, but we'll see if we can figure out how to break through the firewall. Yes. But I just thought it was it was such a good piece because you know, at first um, they were trying to get your, uh, your child to protect you because you yes. were a dark black woman. And then the next day, they were, you're talking about your daughter the exact yes. same way because they realized she was not white. And yeah. it was just so well done that whole trying to tell the story to an eight year old at this yes. point of what you're doing. At the same time, you're doing edits on this book. At the same yes. time, <laughs> as you're, you're, this is a national worldwide conversation Correct. that is being brought quickly to a head, quickly to go like this. But I felt that the way you handled it there was like one day they're worried about you, the next day they worry about her. And Correct. it was. Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and I had to write it again in that kind of nuance because for me, I feel like bridging understanding between cultures is really truly my purpose. I that's my mm-hmm. that's what drives me is if I can explain things in a way that both sides, even if you don't agree, can get closer and understand. That's mm-hmm. my purpose, right? And so for that New York piece is saying, on the one hand. Sweden is known worldwide as a protector of global human rights. Mm -hmm. I love Sweden for that. You know, it's my new country. They do great things. But then at the same time, it's, is it also the ultimate white savior? Like how, you know, and that's the image it does portray, you know. Mm -hmm. And what I was trying to say is those kids are trying to protect because they feel like, we don't have agency to protect ourselves. So we come in to then protect, to take all the refugees and to do all this, but what's the follow through? And then when you, when you are in that situation, then you can't complain mm-hmm. or you can't say anything or you have to be perpetually grateful mm-hmm. to some power, you know? And so I was trying to kind of explain that, you know, is that life is a lot more messy and complicated and nuanced than just saying, I moved to this country, now I have to be quiet and sit in a corner. It doesn't work that way. People 
want to be seen. People want mm-hmm. to have purpose in life. People want to give back, especially cultures that are moving in that come from really community. They want to give back. Mm-hmm. That was why in, with Muna, work was given a purpose she wanted to do. And if you don't give people that space, then that's what breeds resentment, right? You know, and I, I, I talked about the refugee center mm-hmm. where there's a comment. And she wanted yeah. to work. She didn't want to get something for free. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that is the kind of the false narrative that keeps getting pushed is that people come to take, which is mm-hmm. not true. You know, it's not, it's really not true, you know, and it's the same narrative in the U.S. as well. I mean, I'm Nigerian American. I lived in the U.S. 16 uh, years as well. So it's this people aren't, <laughs> coming to just take, you know, and and I hope, you know, with what's going on with the new kind of what's going on in Afghanistan, that people understand mm-hmm. that this is traumatic for people. People mm-hmm. do not want to leave their homes to just go take something else. They if they'd rather be home and be safe, you know, and mm-hmm. I hope that this breeds more empathy as people come in to find kind of a some kind of safer space to start rebuilding from scratch. Yeah, I would agree with you because I think so many times, yeah, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for their family to still be there. They're yeah. looking for their same kind of community or whatever. It's not like they want to completely rebuild and no. they're, they're looking for their same sense of security. And just because you got up, um, you know, rooted to someplace else doesn't mean you want it for free. You don't yes. want it. You want to be able to contribute. And she's very, Luna really wants to contribute and be part of things, but she's stymied so many places. It's, you know, you're not good enough. You're not good yes. enough. Yes. Yes. So, um, I want to also talk about your separated book into sections. So yes. let's talk. And there's usually something dramatic at the end of the section. <laughs> what made you decide to do it in sections? Well, because I wanted to jump in time frames, you know, I really wanted to, I wanted, I had to stop writing at some point because the book is already over 400 pages. And if I kept going and going in a more kind of closer time frames, then the book would be up to like 800 pages because these are full lives, right? So I created those sections for logical jumps. So I could um, say, you know what, mm-hmm. I want to fast forward Britney's love life, you know, oh, I want to get came me to this new skivy situation with this guy, you know, or oh, I want to get uh, Mona to the next step. So that's why I kind of broke them into sections. So I could also up a little bit more mm-hmm. in the future. Yeah. And, you know, also people are changing along the way as well. Kemi is looking for one kind of guy at the beginning. And by the end, she's looking for somebody very different because yes. she's realizing the guy at the beginning is a little bit too edgy. It's a little bit too this. And it's not, not going to make um, calm days happen in her life. It's not going to be calm. It's going to constantly have edge. So I think right. that that's what she's seeing, you know? Yes, no, absolutely. So, and she's, Was the title uh, always this? Was the title always in every version? No, no. It was actually called uh, Afro Sweet before. That was the kind of working title. But then we did kind of some testing in house with the amazing source books. You know, we tried different titles. We felt like that Afro Sweet title wasn't enough to capture the book fully mm-hmm. because Afro Sweet is, when I consider an Afro Sweet is someone that either has one parent or was born in Sweden, you know. So that doesn't really define the kind of women's stories. So we had to come up with a different title. So we tried different titles and then this was the one that that just we felt captured what this book was trying to say in terms of you see them first as black without even getting to know who they are or what their stories are. Mm-hmm. And when you look in, that's the one thing they all see when they look in the mirror. That's the one common thread that the three of them have. And you know, it's interesting because if you've gone with the other title, I would have thought it had something to do with Ikea or yes. like <laughs> something like that. And I wouldn't have thought there was a book yeah. that came out horse horse store or something like that a couple of years ago. And that's what I would have gone for. We're here. It was completely defined. Now you're a very visual person. How involved were you in the cover? Oh my goodness. Well, the cover was designed by the amazing Kimberly Glider, who has done some really terrific covers. And in terms of designing the cover, I actually just had to write my thoughts down. Just say, you know what? 
I'm thinking of this, I'm thinking of that. These are the characters, these are their ages. And then this information is just passed on to Kimberly and she just comes up with just an amazing, right, <laughs> right of the, out of the door, this amazing cover, you know. And then just with minor tweaks, it was perfect. We didn't have to go through so many things. And my own involvement was more writing down what I was thinking. And so from just those words, she was able to conceptualize, you know, this beautiful, beautiful cover. And she was able to synthesize like right from there. Now yeah, it's, it's actually, it's stunning. And it was stunning it, as soon as it came in. Yeah, thank you. And it stands out. It just, it stands out. You spot it right yeah. away. I mean, we spotted it recently behind Jennifer Lopez in a bookstore. Oh, I <laughs> it love it. Sure. It was like, well, because it's so, it was just like, oh my God, there it is on the shelf behind us. So yes, the book cover really stands out. It's so. an iconic <laughs> cover. Yeah, we're not changing that for the paperback. It's just, no, no, it no, really no. completely works, completely works. Yeah. So in this whole other life, you also do travel photography, you, you teach courses, you do What's it like balancing? I'm not going to try and put this back up. I'll keep going. <laughs> uh, let's, let's do that. Yes. Um, balancing the writing, like yes. finding time to write. I mean, I know you had a long time to publication on this book. It took a long, took many rejections. It took whatever and just shows you just have to rub the right person that can mm -hmm. take the book to the next level. But at the same time, you were doing other things and coming back to this. Yes. So, I mean, absolutely before, I mean, even though I'm a debut novelist, I'm actually uh, quite accomplished travel writer mm -hmm. and author. And um, my book right before this is published in 18 different languages. It's nonfiction called Logum. And before that, the book before that was the kind of 2018 winner of best travel book mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. well, you know, uh, from the Society of American Travel Writers. And I've had over 20, you know, 20 years of writing and photography and doing a lot of work within the travel industry. So even though this is um, my kind of official foray into uh, like being a novelist, published novelist, I do do a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. And I am what you will call like a multi-potentialite. So somebody that thrives with on different creative interests. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, but one feeds into the other. Because yes. it's, you know, some experience that you had will feed into the writing. I mean, people will just sit in a room and say, I'm going to write 200 words a day and I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. It's prescriptive. And it's yes. sort of writing is not prescriptive. You might've been able to write a third of this book, just sitting down. That's like, this is what I have. Here's my messy draft. Go from there. Correct. Yeah. And, and for me, I always say, because they say, if you have writer's block, try and push through it and just write. Or, you know, people say that that does not work for me. Mm -hmm. um if i'm not if the inspiration is not coming i switch to a different creative talent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's either maybe i'm painting you know or i'm um, taking photo photos and uh, so that i give the writing uh, part of my brain time to rest mm -hmm. and refresh mm -hmm. so that's what i do so i switch to a different medium i use that to communicate to do what i want to do so that when i come back i'm already coming back creatively charged and then i can get some of those words back into the writing you know like mm -hmm. this is what i saw as a photographer now i can get it visually into the writing to make mm -hmm. it just very um sensory you know so mm -hmm. so that's what works for me it's just switching if i'm not if i'm not inspired i don't force it i actually mm -hmm. do not i just switch to a different medium do what i need to do and then come back yeah, and i totally understand as, as i was reading the book which would be just reading as folding down things i thought i might want to talk to you about Yes, <laughs> And then did not go back to those until I actually wrote the questions and mm. then went back to those things because you want to get something fresh. My husband always sees, he comes up because I'm working from home now, looks on my computer, goes, how can you have all those tabs open? And what he doesn't <laughs> realize is there's sometimes I don't feel like doing accounting or yes. I don't feel like doing this. It has to get done, but I will motor from one thing to the next. Or if I'm interrupted, I need something that's interruptible. Like yeah. that's that everybody's yes. going to come in the interruptible thing. You know? Yes. No, absolutely. <laughs> so much fun. Yeah, you have interrupters all day long, all day long. So what's next? What are you working on? Are you working on a new piece of fiction? Yes, I am. I am working. I've got a bunch of ideas I'm working on. Um, I'm working on some of the, even more with these characters. Who knows, you know, but I am mm -hmm. working on a lot of things. And uh, yeah, so yeah. I have stuff they, in the works. They are definitely developed enough that they could show up elsewhere. They could yes. show up 
in the background or they could show up in the front <laughs> ground of you know yes. another title. You can just absolutely see it. And it's funny because yeah. I was thinking of Tara Jenkins Reid and she's got that one character, Mick Reva, that's in all three of yes. the books. Yes. So you could <laughs> weave these people in the same way yes. she did with him. And it's like, yes. and the, the careful reader noticed it, but a lot of people, it went completely over their heads over there. what was going yes. on. Yeah, no, but that's the kind of thing, you know, so uh, she's just an amazing writer. I'm really super grateful uh, for just for her support on this, uh, mm -hmm. that she really liked this. And yeah, so, um, you know, I'm working on, on this. There's so many different characters that could be mm -hmm. fleshed out. I mean, there is the one character, Yagis, who is the Turkish business mm -hmm. owner that's a yes. uh, complicated character on his own, you know. And so there are many uh, routes, you know, that the book or oh, like follow on projects can take as well. So. Yeah, we'll we can see. always go back to Yanni's parents at some point as well yes, and just see yes. what they're up to now. Because yeah, exactly. It's, it's got to be like a brutal childhood friend as well, because mm. you were realizing he definitely has issues, like yes. his issues, but no one was ever dealing with it. And you could clearly yeah. tell, and it's the reason I think he got away with a lot of what he got away with in life. Yes. It's because, all right, we're just going to, he's different. We'll give him a company. Like, yeah. <laughs> we're wealthy enough here. We'll give exactly. him a company. Let him go run the company. That's and privilege. Yeah. That is privilege on display for sure. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. like you think of that the show Succession on uh what is it? Uh HBO. It's like, yes, everybody just gets a job. You just yeah. get a job, you get something yeah. to do, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, this has been such a privilege on my part to be able to get to oh, talk to you. you. I so enjoyed this book. So oh, enjoyed it. Likewise. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's uh, was fun chatting. <laughs> I love talking about these characters. I love them. So. I can tell. I can tell. It's part of what made the discussion so fun. And I just couldn't believe it. I had to look up at page 339, everybody. That's where they meet up. Yes. I was so surprised because I thought when I first heard about this book, I thought it was going to be something completely different. I thought yeah. they might be working in the same place. I thought, and I had in my head how the book was going to be structured and what it was going to be. And it was a very um, fun surprise to see that I was surprised. I didn't but, see things quite the way they no, were. Absolutely. And I had to I had to keep the book really real, right? In reality, all three of them would not be friends. No. So why would they be hanging out throughout the book? You know, so no. I needed to keep the book really real. And yeah. which is part of the message of the book as well. So mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, we look forward to the next book. We're ready yes. for it anytime. <laughs> well, we'll pick up the little nuances. We're ready. Yes. We're there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carol. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> and to our readers, we look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks to.